Exactly 78 years ago, the Red Army was advancing at full speed towards Berlin, having broken through the German defenses on the Vistula. Faced with the total collapse of the Eastern Front, and the threat to which the Reich capital was increasingly exposed, one of the worst possible decisions was made, and Himmler was appointed Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Vistula. His mission was to stop the Soviet advance, and therefore prevent the Red Army from getting closer to Berlin. With this appointment, the German leader wanted Himmler to carry out all his orders without protest, as if the generals of the army did, and for him to apply very harsh measures with his own troops so that no soldier would retreat to the West. As Hitler intended, his subordinate did everything she was told, but it was not enough to stop Zhukov's advance. This great counterattack that occurred in what is known as Operation Solstice was one of those desperate orders that were given during those days and that we are going to analyze in depth below. It all started when on January 12, 1945, the Soviets attacked on the Vistula front and quickly broke through the German defenses. This frantic advance through Poland led them to be only 70 kilometers from Berlin by the beginning of February. However, this penetration had not been carried out equally throughout the front line, and this caused the right flank of the first Belarusian front, commanded by Zhukov, to be totally exposed to a German attack. So, and faced with this situation, Zhukov began to debate with his generals what was the best decision to adopt. Continue towards a Berlin that at that time was unprotected, just as Zhukov wanted, or secure the conquered territory and consolidate its flanks. While this series of meetings was taking place, on February 6, Stalin telephoned Zhukov to ask what they were doing. After Marshal Zhukov had explained the situation to him, Stalin told him to cut this nonsense and attack north in support of Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front. In addition, in the Soviet rear, the Germans remained resisting in Kurland, and now also in East Prussia. General Guderian, who had been chief of the general staff of the Army High Command since July 1944, had been requesting the total evacuation of Kurland for many months, now also requested that a corridor be kept open in Pomerania, which would allow units to leave Germans still in East Prussia. His intention was to concentrate all these troops to launch a great counterattack from Pomerania in a southerly direction, with the aim of sectioning the Soviet vanguards. This was also intended to stop the Soviet advance on Berlin, which the Germans believed was imminent. On the other hand, Himmler was dejected by the situation, and was now in the role of having to continuously inform Hitler of the failures he obtained on the battlefield. This caused him to be seen more and more with worse eyes by Hitler, and their relationship began to get very cold. In an attempt to win the confidence of the German leader, and regain prominence, Himmler did not stop talking about imminent counterattacks that his troops would carry out, although without specifying any in particular. With this we came to a meeting that took place at the beginning of February, in which Guderian proposed to launch this offensive, for which it was required to evacuate Kurland and East Prussia. You must believe me when I say that it is not obstinacy that leads me to propose so strongly the evacuation of Kurland. I can't think of any other way that we can keep to accumulate reserves, without which we have no hope of defending the capital. I guarantee that I am moved only by the interests of Germany. Guderian told Hitler. How dare you speak to me like that? Hitler yelled at him. Is it that I'm not fighting for Germany? My whole life has been nothing but one long battle for Germany. From this point on, the conversation between the two became more tense, until they managed to calm down and came to the conclusion that it was the best option they had. However, this operation would be launched with far fewer troops than Guderian had requested, as the full evacuation of either Kurland or East Prussia was not approved. In the same way, we must indicate that if it had been approved, it would not have been possible to have those units in Pomerania ready to participate in the offensive, since the attack was going to start imminently. Guderian also requested that Himmler not be the commander leading the attack, and instead proposed General Wenck. Himmler for his part, was not able to assert his point of view, and the situation was completely beyond him. He knew that he did not have enough men, 
ammunition, or fuel to carry out the operation that was demanded of him, but he had no other option than to comply with the order if he did not want to face Hitler badly. At this time Himmler still had the total sympathy of Hitler, and this was reflected in the defense that the German leader made with him, when Guderian did not stop insisting that Himmler be suspended from his military position. The conversation was as follows. Himmler is enough to bear the brunt of the attack alone, Hitler said. The Reichsfuhrer SS does not have the necessary experience or a staff competent enough to control the attack without help. Therefore, the presence of General Wenk is essential, replied Guderian. I do not allow you to tell me that Himmler is incapable of fulfilling his duty, Hitler finished shouting. Finally after new discussions, Hitler ended up accepting that Wenk helped Himmler in the direction of the offensive. On paper, the number of troops assigned to this operation is staggering, since it was supposed to have some 1,200 tanks. The reality, however, was far from being like that, and most could not be transported to Pomerania, and those who were finally able to participate did not have the necessary ammunition or gasoline. Let us remember that the great offensive that was being prepared at that time was the one that began a few weeks later at Lake Balaton, which intended to defend the capital of Hungary and the last sources of oil for the Third Reich. Thus, the German force that was commissioned to carry out this mission was the 11th SS Panzer Army, commanded by the famous General Felix Steiner, which was made up of 11 divisions, seven of which were Panzer divisions. Once again, one must not be fooled by the name, because for this operation, in total they added no more than 300 tanks of all kinds, with fuel and ammunition for just several days of combat. The offensive began on the 15th with the first German attack in the vicinity of present-day Chashezno, having an initial success because it surprised the Soviets. The next day, most of the German units attacked at Stargard, which is located somewhat further to the northwest, thereby expanding the width of the front's penetration. However, after these first two days, in which the Germans advanced no more than 20 kilometers south, the offensive completely stalled. This was because the Soviets quickly mobilized and began sending units into the area, which led to a furious tank battle against the Second Guard's tank army. During this combat, the 12 Tiger II's that participated in this operation were very effective and managed to shoot down numerous Soviet tanks, but they could do nothing when Zhukov counterattacked with all his energy. To aggravate the situation, on the 17th General Wenk suffered a serious car accident that prevented him from continuing to participate in the operation. In any case, it all ended when on February 19th, Zhukov launched a counteroffensive aimed at the capture of Stettin, threatening to cut off all remaining German forces in Pomerania east of the Oder River. To this attack was added another series of offensives that General Rokosovsky started a few days later, which also went straight into the heart of Pomerania. This ended up unbalancing the German defenses and forced them into a general withdrawal in which a lot of heavy material had to be abandoned because there was no way to move it due to lack of fuel and adequate communications. Finally, it should be noted that a sudden thaw occurred these days, which, although it favored the defense of the odor, made these actions very difficult in Pomerania, since the terrain became a large quagmire. Thus, although this offensive did not fulfill the objective of sectioning off the Soviet vanguard and inflicting a large number of casualties on them, in a similar way to Manstein's counteroffensive in Kharkov, it did serve to buy time. After her, the Soviet high command became convinced of the impossibility of carrying out a rapid attack on Berlin until control of the Pomeranian coastline was secured, which gave the Germans time to prepare the defenses on the Oder. In any case, it must be said that everything indicates that the Soviets are already convinced of this, even if this German offensive called Operation Solstice had not been carried out. However, during those days, the German high command did not see it that way, and considered it a great failure without justification, which made Himmler fall out of favor in the eyes of Hitler, who no longer considered him as capable as before. As we have pointed out at the beginning, the idea of this operation was one of Guderian's last contributions during World War II, although the way in which it was organized was far from what Guderian had originally proposed. But what do you think? 
Do you think that this offensive was necessary and did it have a lot to do with the fact that the Soviets did not attack Berlin earlier? Do you think it could have been done with a much greater force, as Guderian proposed? March 1945 There are only a few weeks left for the end of the Second World War in Europe, but the German army, even though it is practically finished, is capable of launching a new desperate offensive using its last panzers. Today we are going to analyze how one of the final battles of this conflict took place, which involved more than 600,000 troops, but due to its little importance, it has been practically forgotten. We are referring to Operation Spring Awakening, also known as the Lake Balaton Offensive, which is considered to be the last major German offensive on the Eastern Front. Before beginning with the exposition of this final German attack to the south of the capital of Hungary, let's put ourselves in context. To do this, let's go back two months earlier, to the beginning of January 1945. Here we find a Third Reich that, although it has been able to withstand the Allied attacks in the summer of 1944, is now completely surrounded. To the west, its defensive line is practically on its original border, while on the eastern front it still has a little more margin. The first weeks of the year 1945 are very hard for Germany, because their last hopes placed in the Ardennes offensive are lost, and on the other hand, the Soviets break the Vistula front, and advance practically without opposition towards Berlin. At this point, Goebbels himself came to recognize in his diary that the situation for them was going to get very difficult, the continuity of his government being in serious danger. Once the Soviet threat to the German capital became apparent, many of the armored units that were participating in the Ardennes offensive had to withdraw. Guderian saw here a great opportunity to use these divisions on the Eastern Front, as he had wanted from the start. One of the strongest formations they still had was General Sepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army, and this was the unit Guderian wanted to use to attack the flank of the Soviet army heading for Berlin. Hitler, however, had other plans in mind, because according to his criteria, Berlin was not yet in danger, since the Soviets were going to take care of consolidating their flanks first. His generals believed otherwise and began the hasty defense of the Oder River, against what the German leader wanted. When, a few weeks later, it turned out that Hitler had been right, and the Soviets had not rushed headlong into Berlin, but had instead taken up other positions across Poland and East Prussia, Hitler was very furious with them. Having to comply with his will, the last German armored reserves were sent to Hungary, where multiple German attempts to liberate the city of Budapest had failed. In any case, the important objective of the operation was the protection of the last oil wells that were located in western Hungary, and that at this time produced 80% of all the fuel that Germany spent. After the loss of Romanian oil, and most of what they produced synthetically in their facilities due to bombing, this was all that was left to the Third Reich. By this date the fuel available for the Panzer divisions, as well as for the Luftwaffe, had already been reduced to historical minimums, but losing the Hungarian oil would cause the German military capacity to collapse. Based on this, an offensive was planned to drive the Soviets back to the Danube, and establish more secure defensive positions to protect these oil fields in Hungary. In addition, once the entire western bank of the Danube had been secured, it was later intended to liberate the city of Budapest, and send the remaining units to the Oder River, to support the defense of the German capital. To meet these objectives, at the end of February the German leader ordered the commander of Army Group South, General Otto Wohler, to prepare an attack in the vicinity of Lake Balaton. The 6th SS Panzer Army would participate in the offensive, which would attack from the north of Lake Balaton, the 2nd Panzer Army, which would attack from the south of the lake, and Army Group E, which would attack from the south of the Drava River to the north. Together they had to expel the 3rd Ukrainian Front to the eastern bank of the Danube. Finally the date for the launch of this offensive was set on March 5, 1945. For this operation the Germans had assembled a force of 19 divisions, of which 8 were Panzer or Panzer Grenadier formations. In total they numbered about 220,000 men and 870 battle tanks and armored vehicles. However, and as was the case with Germany at this time, on paper it seemed a powerful force, but the reality of the authentic status of these units was very different. 
They were mostly worn-out troops and many of these divisions were made up of poorly trained and poorly armed conscripts. Opposite them were the forces of the 3rd Ukrainian Front, under the command of Marshal fighter Talbukin. After the fall of Budapest, Talbukin had begun plans for offensive towards Vienna, but he was forced to delay it when Soviet intelligence detected that a major German attack was about to take place in the area. What the marshal did was to consult with the Soviet high command the steps to follow, and finally they decided that it would be better to let the Germans attack, and then go on to counterattack. Saving all the distances, it would be something similar to what they did during Operation Citadel in 1943. For this they would have about 400,000 troops and 700 combat tanks. Not knowing that they were walking into a trap, by the beginning of March the German units began to arrive at the assigned points. This was not an easy task for the German panzer divisions, because due to the thaw, the roads became muddy. In any case, the attack order was already given and there was no going back. At 1 a.m. on March 6, 1945, the worn-out elite German divisions, these being the Leibstandarte, Das Reich and the hitler Jugend, among many others, began the last German offensive of World War II. The first unit to attack across the Drava River was the German 91st Army Corps, which was able to cross the river and establish a small bridgehead. Three hours later the 2nd Panzer Army joined, attacking from south of Lake Balaton. After little initial success, the Germans were deadlocked following the arrival of Soviet reinforcements in the area. Although these attacks were secondary, it was clear that his progress was even worse than expected. The main German offensive was the one that was going to be carried out by the 6th SS Panzer Army, which launched the attack at first light on March 6. The advance obtained by this elite body was not what was expected either, since it barely advanced a few kilometers during the first day. By the night of that March 6, they had only taken a few minor towns, and were still stuck in the Soviet front line of defense, having to fight through mud and jam from the heavier panzers. From the first moment they had to face large Soviet concentrations, which led to multiple battles along the entire front line. Little by little the Germans made their way and the Soviets gave way, making the German advance more forceful the next day. For this day March 7, the Germans were able to open the field and get out of their jam, attacking from a wider line. This forced Marshal Talbukin to send reinforcements to the area, especially his armored guard units. However, this did not prevent the Leibstandarte and the 12th hitler Jugend Division from breaking through their front, now advancing at full speed towards the Danube River. In any case, let us remember that the Soviets were interested in the German vanguards advancing as far as possible, in order to start the trap they had prepared for them. The advance of these German units had been so great that they had left their left flank completely exposed, thus requiring the other German divisions to advance as well. From this point the days went by without any German army corps being able to make further progress. In the south, both 2nd Panzer Army and Army Group E had long since stagnated, and things for 6th Panzer Army were not much better. By March 16, once the Germans had been blocked, the Soviets began their offensive just west of the city of Budapest. This made them place themselves in the weak German rearguard, which threatened to leave isolated all the German troops, who had gone on the offensive a few days before. As if history were repeating itself, the Soviets again attacked through areas that were garrisoned by Hungarian divisions, which were quickly razed to the ground. Although this concentration of Soviet units had been partially detected by the Germans, Hitler had insisted that the German vanguard units continue to attack, in their attempt to reach the Danube. So while the Soviets attacked, the Germans continued to fight near Azora. Once it was seen that the Soviet armies had penetrated deep into the German rear, and were advancing unopposed, Generals Wohler and Dietrich were finally able to obtain approval for the 1st SS Panzer Corps to be withdrawn north, to try to plug the gaps and avoid the encirclement of the entire 6th SS Panzer Army. From this point on, the Germans desperately tried to defend themselves but were unable to stop the avalanche that came upon them. By March 18, the German elite units were forced to give up all the territory that they had conquered with so much blood and suffering a few days ago. Despite the fact that north of Lake Balaton the situation was critical, the order came from Berlin to continue attacking wherever they could, 
So the second panzer army continued to disengage in its attempt to advance a few meters. Finally on March 23rd, and given the criticality of the situation, Hitler was forced to accept a general withdrawal, given the danger that part of the 6th Army would be surrounded to the east of Lake Balaton. From this point on, fighting continued relentlessly along the entire Hungarian front, until by April the Soviets reached Vienna. In addition, a few days before they also stripped the Germans of their Hungarian oil wells, thus finishing off the combat power of the Wehrmacht. In short, after less than three weeks, the last major German offensive it had ended with a maximum advance of less than 40 kilometers, followed by a devastating Soviet counterattack that finished driving the Germans out of the region. It had ended with a maximum advance of less than 40 kilometers, followed by a devastating Soviet counterattack that finished driving the Germans out of the region. April 16, 1945. The Vistula Army Group under the command of General Heinricke desperately resists the assault that the Red Army has just begun. Of all the units Heinricke has, General Bussey's 9th Army is the most important of all, and the one receiving Zukov's main attack. These German defenses defending the Oder River were the last chance they had to stop the Red Army before they entered Berlin. Zukov hoped that his overwhelming superiority of 7 to 1 in infantry and 6 to 1 in tanks would serve to overwhelm the Germans in just a few hours of engagement. However, the various defensive lines that Heinricke had prepared on the Silo Hills held up well, and the battle dragged on for three days. Once the German defenses were breached, the depleted German units had to fall back in the direction that the chaotic situation allowed them to. There were some who retreated to the northwest and joined the famous General Steiner. Others retreated westward into the city of Berlin, as was the case with General Helmuth Weidling with his 56th Panzer Corps, who was later appointed commander of the defense of Berlin. Finally, there were others like General Bussey who, with the remnants of what remained of the 9th Army, retreated to the southwest. However, it was not only Zukov's first Belarusian front that had attacked that April 16, for a little further south, Konyev's first Ukrainian front had also gone on the offensive. Although Zukov's armies had been bogged down around the Silo Hills for four days, Konyev's troops had penetrated the German defenses at full speed, completely shattering the 4th Panzer Army defending that sector. Thus, Konyev's first Ukrainian front got ahead of Zukov and from the second day of the start of his offensive was already heading at full speed towards the southwest of Berlin. This caused that General Bussey found his route of retreat cut off, since the Red Army was located in the German rear. They only had contact on their northern flank with the outskirts of Berlin, which would also soon be cut off by the Soviets. Finding the remnants of the 9th Army blocked to the south of Berlin, the order they received from Hitler on April 21st was to hold their position, and establish defenses both to the east and to the west. Later they had to prepare to attack the first Ukrainian front in a western direction, and repel the attack that Berlin was suffering from the south. Clearly this was beyond the reach of Bussey's depleted troops, who after six days of intense fighting were totally exhausted, out of almost ammunition and fuel, and had lost most of their heavy equipment. Everything got even more complicated when on April 22nd the Soviets cut off the road connecting the 9th Army with the Berlin garrison, leaving some 200,000 men isolated in what was known as Halby's Kessel. The territory that Bussey occupied was like an inverted triangle, about 30 kilometers wide at its top, from which it narrowed as it descended another 30 kilometers towards its southern apex. At this point Manstein's former disciple had three options. First, he could try to break through to the west and contact the forces of Wenck's 12th Army. After this, he had the option to join forces with General Wenck to attack the Soviets together, or continue to the Elba to surrender to the Americans. Without a doubt it would be a very hard march, in which they would have to fight against the Soviets who would attack them from all sides, while advancing west. There is no doubt that thousands of soldiers would be lost along the way, and those who could not walk would have to be abandoned. The second option was to head north and enter Berlin to help defend the city. This was precisely the order that Hitler had given him when Berlin had also been surrounded. Bussey knew that the city was lost and that entering the city would mean the death of most of his men in agonizing combat. Finally, 
General Bussey could surrender and trust the Soviets to treat his men well, but due to the ferocity of the Eastern Front, there was no guarantee that this would happen. Faced with this scenario and totally desperate, Bussey decided not to contradict Hitler and prepared to go to Berlin. However, while the 9th Army was preparing to go to Berlin, Bussey received an order from Heinricke, who we remember was his direct superior, instructing him not to go to the slaughterhouse that Berlin was going to suppose, and to try to join the Wenck's 12th Army. The prospects for such an escape were not bad, as Konyev's armies were centered in Berlin, and his main task was to surround the city and advance inland, so he had not left many troops to fight Bussey. Bussey for his part needed several days to decide what to do, until finally on April 25th he decided that he would not go to support the defense of Berlin, but would try to break the siege heading west to join the 12th Army. This three-day delay that Bussey needed to make this decision made Konyev much more settled on the ground, because with Berlin already surrounded, he was able to pay more attention to Halby's encirclement. Without a doubt, what Konyev wanted to protect was his rear and his supply line that ran right through where the 9th Army had to pass in its retreat. This being the situation, Bussey organized two breakout units with which to break through the enemy lines and on the 25th he began his evasion attack. After heavy fighting, the next day his escape attempt was blocked and the German vanguard units had to return to the encirclement. At the same time as this was taking place, the Soviets began to apply pressure from all directions, reducing Halby's pocket to a tenth of its original size by the 27th and 28th. We have to indicate that the situation in which the troops of the 9th Army were found could not be more painful, since he barely had food, ammunition, and medicine. To this we must add that they had to take care of tens of thousands of wounded who they could no longer attend to, since there were some 10,000 civilians with them who shared their agonizing situation. As if that were not enough, the Soviet artillery did not stop firing at them, exploding their projectiles at a certain height so that the damage was greater. On the other hand, and as we have mentioned before, the 12th Army was heading towards Berlin from the Elbe River by order of Hitler on April 23rd. It was here that the German leader devised his last strategy of the war, which briefly gave him hope while he was surrounded in Berlin. The order he issued was for the 9th and 12th Army to attack Pinzer southwest of Berlin, then head for the Reich capital and drive back the Soviets. At the same time Steiner would attack from the north, and together they would cause the Red Army its greatest defeat in the war. This gave rise to the scene that was depicted in the Downfall movie, in which Hitler is seen issuing the following telegram. Point number one. Where is Wenck's army? Point number two. When and where will he carry out his attack? Point three. Where is the 9th Army? Point four. Where will he attack to break the Soviet siege on Berlin? The responses of Keitel, who was already out of Berlin at the time, were totally sincere and without any intention of embellishing reality. In short, he told him that neither Wenck's nor Bussey's troops were going to be able to make any liberation attack on the city, and therefore all was lost. Finally Keitel asked Hitler again to leave Berlin, to which the German leader again refused. A few hours later, Hitler committed suicide. Returning now to the critical situation of the men of the 9th Army, it was clear that Bussey had to try again to get out of the encirclement and connect with Wenck, because his troops were about to be annihilated. Thus, on the 28th, Bussey summoned his main commanders to study the plan to adopt. The decision they made was to regroup their few armored forces, and soldiers who were still able to fight, and organize a last breakout attempt. Thus, during that afternoon of April 28, the men of the 9th Army began their offensive. After intense fighting, there were some columns that managed to advance and others were stalled. During the 29th the painful march of this German column continued, suffering more and more casualties. 50 kilometers separated them from Wenck's troops, who could do nothing to try to close the distance from their positions, as they were also being attacked by the Soviets in all directions. By April 30th, the remnants of the 9th Army were 10 kilometers from Wenck, after having suffered tens of thousands of casualties between dead, wounded who had not been able to continue, and soldiers who had been taken prisoner. It was finally on May 1st that Bussey's exhausted men were able to reach Wenck, 
then began the march to the Elba River to surrender to the Americans. However, unfortunately for them, the Americans rejected most of these soldiers and ended up being taken prisoner by the Soviets. It is difficult to give an exact figure, but it is estimated that of the 200,000 Germans who were surrounded in the Halby pocket, only 30,000 or 40,000 reached the position of the 12th Army, with about 120,000 falling prisoner and the other 60,000 dying in the attempt. Ultimately only a few thousand were taken prisoner by the Americans, the vast majority falling into Soviet hands. On April 21, 1945, while Berlin was already under ground attack by Zhukov's Red Army some 150 kilometers further south, German Marshal Ferdinand Schorner launched a counterattack that would go down in history as the last victory of the German army on the Eastern Front. So in this offensive, some weakened German forces that only a few days ago had been torn to pieces by the Soviet army, managed to quickly regroup and present this last fight when all was lost. But how was this possible? And what impact did it have? Well, that is exactly what we are going to see next. By the beginning of April, the German army was defending the banks of the Oder River, which is located to the east of Berlin, and the Nysa River to the southeast, which in turn connects with the Oder. Despite the total collapse that had occurred a few days ago on the Western Front, the last German units such as the 9th and 17th Army, and the 3rd and 4th Panzer Armies, awaited the final Soviet assault in these positions. As we have analyzed in other programs, once the Soviets began this final offensive against the Third Reich, it was precisely Marshal Schorner's front in Nies that was the first to sink. Thus while General Heinrichs' forces held out in the Silo Hills, on April 17 the Second Polish Army, which was embedded within Konyev's first Ukrainian front, penetrated widely into the German defenses south of Kotbis. In just one day, the Soviets had opened a gap of 28 kilometers, and after making a turn to the northwest, they began to approach the city of Lubin. Let us remember that this city was very important because it had been the point at which Stalin had established the operational freedom of Konyev and Zhukov. In other words, if Ivan Konyev managed to get there before his comrade Zhukov, he could be the one to advance towards the conquest of Berlin to the south. This made as we can imagine, that both Soviet marshals attacked with the greatest possible ferocity, in which the only thing that mattered was to advance as fast as they could. Over the next few days, Konyev's first Ukrainian front continued to advance at full speed, and by April 20th it had already conquered Botsyn and reached the height of Dresden, in an advance of more than 100 kilometers. While to the north of said position, Zhukov gradually began to overcome the German defenses at Silo after four days of heavy fighting. As we see on the map, Konyev's advance had occurred in a fairly linear fashion from east to west, with a turn north towards Berlin on the right flank, with which he had also encircled some 200,000 Germans on the known as Halby's Bag. On the other hand, this Soviet penetration had left their southern flank quite neglected, assuming that after the heavy defeat they had just inflicted on the Germans in that sector, there was not much to worry about. Thus, although they continued with their corresponding reconnaissance flights throughout the area, they did not detect the concentration of troops that Schorner was making south of Botzen, due in part to the fact that it was a heavily wooded area. This led the Polish general who commanded the 2nd Polish Army, which was located in that sector, not to comply with the orders he had received from Konyev to protect the region, and instead decided to advance towards Dresden. Schorner's plan was to launch a counteroffensive against this unsuspecting Polish flank, with which he hoped to paralyze the advance that the right wing of the 1st Ukrainian Front was making in the sector. In addition, the German marshal also hoped to continue advancing north to connect with Bussey's troops, who had been retreating from the Oder, with the intention of jointly supporting the defense of Berlin. For this counterattack that the Germans were going to launch in the direction of Botzen, the recently promoted Marshal Schorner had three panzer divisions, one of them being Hermann Göring's own division, the 20th and 21st. In addition, he had two infantry divisions and another Volksgrenadier. In total, they added about 50,000 troops with about 300 tanks. The man in charge of directing the attack was General Hubert Grazer, who had commanded the 4th Panzer Army since September of the previous year, 
and that since then, it had not been able to do anything other than retreat little by little from the Vistula River to its present position south of Botzen. On the other hand, the Polish Second Army had approximately twice the strength of the Germans, although it was far more dispersed over the territory. The Polish 8th and 9th Infantry Divisions were in the vanguard leading the attack in the direction of Dresden, along with another Soviet Army Corps further to the northwest. Further back, the Polish 5th Infantry Division marched along with a tank brigade, while the 7th and 10th Infantry Divisions had not yet crossed the Nysa. Once again, and as had happened so many times, the Soviets had their largest size in their favor, while the Germans had a part of their troops with a lot of combat experience. In addition, their concentration of forces in the vicinity of Botzen also gave them quite an advantage compared to the dispersion of these new Red Army units. Well, after having made this presentation of the rivals faced and their situation, let's go to the development of the battle. The German attack began on April 21st, led by the 20th and 21st Panzer Divisions in the direction of Botzen, and the 17th Infantry Division on Niski. It should be noted that along the way, they were able to add to the fight German soldiers who had been isolated by the terrain after the Soviet penetration. The first reaction of the Polish General Karol was to ignore the German attack and not give it much importance, because he did not think it was anything serious. So, he ordered the vanguard of his army to continue advancing towards Dresden. The result of this first day was the near annihilation of the Polish 5th Division, as well as the tank brigade that accompanied it. Regarding territorial gains, it should be noted that the Germans advanced about 20 kilometers in its central part, while on the left flank they stayed at the gates of Botzen. During the following days the Germans continued advancing, and it was then that the Polish general became aware of the danger his forward divisions ran of being completely isolated. It was then that on the 23rd, he ordered the advance to Dresden to be halted and to concentrate on repelling the German attack. By that date, the Germans had already recaptured the city of Botzen, as well as dozens of small towns in the region, now establishing the front line about 15 kilometers north of Botzen. Faced with such a situation, the Soviet response did not wait any longer. Konyev sent eight units of his army to block the German penetration, among which the 4th Guards Tank Corps stands out, which went to the town of Kamenz to put an end to the German advance. In addition, the Soviet 2nd Air Army was assigned to crush General Grazer's troops from the sky. By April 25th, a Soviet counteroffensive was launched against the German right flank covering the 545th Volksgrenadier Division and drove it back. In addition, with all these reinforcements, the Soviets consolidated a defensive line to the northwest of the small village of Luppa, which rejected any new German breakout attempt. During these days the worst part was taken by the Polish 9th Division, which had been isolated in its advance towards Dresden, and which on the 26th received the order to withdraw and re-establish contact with the Red Army units. Thus, it was forced to have to cross the German lines and after being intercepted in its territory by the Germans, it suffered heavy losses. These days that go from April 25th to 28th, were characterized by a series of combats throughout the German penetration wedge, in which while the Germans were gradually diminishing, running out of ammunition, gasoline, and troops, the side Soviet was only getting stronger. Thus, by April 28, the German offensive was stopped dead with no further chance of advance. While Konyev could have launched a general counteroffensive back to Botzen, all eyes were on the latest fighting in Berlin. On the other hand, it made no sense to attack to the south at that moment, since the definitive offensive on Prague would be launched a week later, after the regrouping of all the troops assigned to said mission. The casualty count was catastrophic for the Poles, who suffered between 18,000 and 25,000 casualties, including some 5,000 deaths and the loss of almost 60% of their armored vehicles, representing some 200 tanks and vehicles lost. Thus, it is striking that this was the bloodiest battle of this Polish army since the one they suffered in Basura in 1939, in which they had some 50,000 casualties. On the other hand, the Germans suffered the loss of about 6,500 troops of which 1,600 were killed. 
Although we can consider this battle as a German victory because they achieved a penetration of the enemy lines of about 25 kilometers, on a global level it lacked importance because it did not achieve the objective of paralyzing the advance of the main force of the first Ukrainian front. Headed for Berlin, nor connect with General Bussy's troops surrounded in Halby. In any case, it did stop the Polish advance on a Dresden that had recently been practically destroyed in the bombardment of the Western Allies in mid-February. Well, this that we have seen is the last battle that the German army won in World War II, being a victory that they again obtained over the Poles, just like at the beginning of the war. If you want to analyze in depth what happened in the Siege of Halby, or other operations such as the counterattack that was also attempted in Pomerania in February 1945, I leave both programs in the description. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.